it's a, um, a real pleasure to be here and as everyone knows, I'm a dog cognition researcher, so for me it's also a real treat to be around people who are working with dogs and handling dogs and training dogs because my world is also is interested in dogs, um, but we go about it in an entirely different way, a way that I hope you know, can more and more converge over time. So today I thought what I would do is just introduce um, myself and a little of the type of work that I do and then talk about um, one kind of behavior that I got very interested in and that I've started to try to apply to looking at working dog populations. So my question was really, if a dog has this theory of mind, if they're thinking about what the other dog knows, then they should be using these play signals and attention getters in specific ways. And here's how. Play signals would be used with a sensitivity to the visual attention of the recipient. They would only start doing play signals when someone could see it. It's not a reflexive behavior. You wait until someone can see your communication before doing it. Second, attention getters would be tailored to the attentional state of the recipient. So as I say, if I want to get your attention and you're standing there just blanked and looking in front of me, I can wave my arms. I don't have to hit you. Right? But if you're turned around, I might have to tap you on the shoulder. Waving my arms does nothing. And there should be a correct order of operations and signaling. So it might look like dogs are using play signals and attention getters right, but if they're doing a play signal and then an attention getter, that's not the right order, right? So then that would entirely belie their, that they have any thinking about others' minds. So what we found is that there was a positive relationship between affect and three of the parameters, movement, how much that person was running around, touch, how much physical contact they had with their dog, and proximity, how close they were to each other. But not between the amount of face-to-face -face contact they had with their dogs. And also, I'll show you in a second, the type of play. So, oops. High movement bouts were positive affect. Here, what you see is, was the amount of movement in play minimal, minor, or considerable? Positive is yellow. And you can see as it gets, as there's more movements, there's more positive affect. And, but as there's minimal movement, about half, more than half the bouts were neutral affect, sort of stony-faced owners. Nostril use, there's some research showing that dogs will smith, s sniff something new and likable first with their right nostril, and then they switch to the left nostril. If it's something horrible, and the researchers used as their stimulus for something horrible for dogs, um, veterinarian sweat, um, <laughs> they stay with the right nostril. And it's thought because the, uh, uh, the nose goes ipsilaterally to the brain, so the right nostril goes to the right hemisphere and the left goes to the left hemisphere, that since the right analyzes fear and aversive s stimuli, that's why unliked stimuli would go in the right nostril, but something that's familiar would go to the left. Um, tail wagging. Um, on seeing strangers and owners, dogs' tail wag is more directed to the right side. Um, Sorry, dog's tail wag is more directed to the right side on seeing familiar people or dogs, and it goes more leftward when they see a stranger. That doesn't mean it's all on the left. It means if you analyze the degree of variance from the center, it's more often at the left to familiar and more often to the right 